Ella Berjvili, and uh, who's a, a good friend, and probably you're going to see him eventually around. He's a former Minister of Defense of Georgia and has been into the security elements for many, many years, so he will be an asset value to you as well. And Mercilia Anastasiadou, she's our moderator and a very good friend and colleague at the Naples University of Paphos. Mercilia, the okay. floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think that we could uh, start uh, today's webinar. So hello everyone, uh, good, or, good morning or uh, good evening from uh, wherever uh, you are joining us from. Uh, my name is uh, Mercilia Anastasiadou and uh, I'm a lecturer in uh, Diplomacy and International Relations at uh, Neapolis University in, uh, in Paphos, in the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, today I will have the pleasure of being the moderator to this uh, webinar, this uh, discussion of uh, experts. Uh, the webinar is a collaboration of the Neapolis University Paphos and uh, Strategy International. And the event is also supported by the NUP Liaison Office in cooperation with the Department of History, Politics and International Studies and takes place under the Career Month Framework for 2022. So uh, today's event is titled Europe at Crossroads, uh, the need for a new European defense architecture, where uh, we hope to provide you with uh, concrete and uh, valuable insights on the European defense landscape, uh, of course, by taking into consideration the recent developments in uh, Ukraine. So a brief summary, uh, the world seems to be in, um, in true crossroads. Uh, does history repeat itself or uh, are we witnessing a new era of security that uh, will affect the Eurasian region? What are we to expect and how do recent uh, developments affect us directly or uh, indirectly? So uh, I am delighted to welcome you all to this uh, webinar to hear out from experts from different regions in uh, discussing their empirical experience and um, work and of course extend a warm welcome to our speakers. Our speakers are uh, Pantelis Klas, a professor and uh, rector of uh, the Neapolis University in uh, Paphos, uh, Kostantinos Arvanidopoulos, a professor of international politics at um, Tufts University, where he holds the Karamanlis chair, uh, Gela Beshuasvili, uh, a former Minister of Defense and uh, uh, collaborator at the uh, Georgian Strategic Analysis Center. Uh, Mark uh, Boiger, uh, Director of the uh, Master Program in Global Management at American University Kiev and uh, Associate Professor. And um, Mario Septimiopoulos, CEO of uh, Strategy International and Associate Professor of International Security and uh, Strategy. So thank you all for joining us this uh, Tuesday, uh, 15th of March, 2022. Uh, just to inform you that the session is recorded and uh, we encourage you to post your comments, questions or ideas to the uh, Q&A session. So I will give the floor to our uh, first uh, speaker. Uh, Professor Mark uh, Boiger. So, Professor, the floor is yours. Uh, if you would like to switch on your microphone. Yes, okay. uh, Marcelia, thank you very much. Uh, before I start, uh, can I ask you to? Um, I have a pro I'm traveling actually, I'm leaving for Ukraine right after I finish my talk. I I'll go back to Western Ukraine for a couple of days. Uh, but I have some issue with my computer. Is there a way you can pull up my slide, the one that I sent this morning, uh, so so we can show them while I'm talking? Because they have some interesting uh, maps and details there. Because uh, um, yeah, from my, I, I'm speaking from my iPhone, and this is uh, you know I'm on the road, and it's a little bit of, of a challenge for me. So while while you're looking for the for those, uh, first of all, it's an, a real honor uh, for me to be joining such a distinguished panel of experts. Uh, and uh, Marius, thank you very much for your friendship and thank you for bringing me on board. Uh, and of course, it's, I'm delighted to see uh, among the panelists, uh, 
a professor who now teaches at Tufts, which is uh, at the Fletcher School, my alma mater in the United States. I know quite well, I knew several of the professors uh, holding the Karamanlis chair back, uh, uh, what is almost 20 years ago. Uh, so this is really a great initiative and, uh, and, and Tufts has been uh, at the forefront of, uh, of studies, uh, Hellenic studies in, in this regard. Um, so the, the topic that I would like to uh, focus on today is directly related to the challenges uh, uh, of the, uh, to the international security system uh, posed by uh, most, most of all Russia, of course, but also other, uh, other actors uh, who, um, who, who actually challenge the, the, uh, the very structure of the international order uh, by, exploiting, uh, uh, by exploiting the law, international and domestic law. Uh, so this Malayan exploitation of, uh, of the law uh, has a name, at least in English, uh, you know, the, we call it lawfare or legal warfare. And so um, uh, this, this term was coined uh, around 2007, 2009, almost, you know, almost 15 years ago uh, by an American professor. He's, he was a, uh, he's a retired major general in the American U.S. Air Force, uh, Charles Dunlap, and he's now the director of the Law Center at uh, Duke University in, uh, in North Carolina. So he coined the term lawfare um, back in the day, and this term has been uh, developing ever since. And, um, you know, when I was working at NATO, um, when we actually met with, with Mario several years ago, uh, I was one of the pioneers in, in applying this lawfare concept to uh, to the analysis of, uh, of the security uh, system uh, at, at, uh, at, an, at NATO. And so I would like to focus today, I don't know, have about 10 minutes, I have about uh, 10 slides to go through uh, and talk about the challenges to, to the international legal system posed by Russian lawfare. And Marcelia, do you have the slides? Uh, actually, I, I am trying to, to upload the presentation. So ah, okay. Okay. So uh, I'll start. I'll, yeah, I'll start. You know, just the uh, by uh, you know talking uh, why, why lawfare is important because uh, everybody talks about uh, hybrid warfare. Uh, everybody talks about hybrid warfare th these days, uh, but most of the most of the time when we when we talk about hybrid, um, we uh, well most experts tend to think that uh, this is primarily information warfare. There is also, of course, the element of cyber, uh, intelligence, of course, uh, and other, and other non-military means. But quite often, um, especially in the past, uh, the, the law was, was not uh, something that was considered part of the, of the hybrid warfare toolbox uh, that Russia and other Malayan actors were using. Uh, part of the reason is that we, we tend to think that law is something, you know, or maybe the public tend, tends to think that law is something, you know, about, uh, you know, international treaties and uh, something that concerns only lawyers. Uh, unfortunately, as I will show you uh, in my presentation, um, the, especially Russia has been extremely, um, extremely good and extremely uh, consistent uh, in using the law as a, as a weapon. Uh, not only currently, but also in Soviet times, and also back in in, in the times of the of the Russian Empire. So, so diplomacy, the law, uh, treaties, and also sort of agreements have always been uh, used uh, by the Russian leadership to actually justify their actions, but most of all to justify aggressions abroad and and conquests. Uh, so they have a really a long-standing uh, tradition in that. Okay. So, uh, as you can see, the primary focus is, is Ukraine and, the, of course, Ukraine in the West, and, uh, you know, goes from uh, 1654, which I'll, I'll explain why this date, until, uh, until this year, until 2020, 2021, 2022. Uh, can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Okay, so, again, um, this is, this is uh, <laughs> a, a professor at uh, professor, uh, uh, professor Chase at, at the Fletcher School back, uh, you know, uh, seven years ago when I, when I was showing this, this graph of, of mine, call, called it the hybrid warfare hydra. Of course, uh, with all of you, you know, uh, being Greek speakers, you know, the hydra obviously is, uh, was the mythological animal with many, many uh, heads. In this case, this one has many hands, many, two, many, many uh, tentacles. Uh, and all of these represent different domains, different, um, uh, different tools that Russia is using in its hybrid warfare uh, strategy. 
Uh, but of course, the central one is a political one, political warfare, the Kremlin and Putin and his elite. But then the, there are many, many others, as I said, the uh, intelligence, uh, cyber, uh, you know, economic uh, energy, you know, all of these that you see. And, and of course, a component, uh, a military conventional component. Uh, but as I said, you know, among these, uh, lawfare is quite uh, underappreciated. And what I argue in my presentation is that the, uh, together with political uh, uh, lawfare and, and information warfare, really form the central um, kind of the, the central piece of uh, of the non-military aspects of Russian um, hybrid warfare. And I'll explain why. As you can see here, you know the the main targets of, of lawfare and, and hybrid warfare uh, are, of course, the West and and the Russian neighbors as. We have tragically seen, uh, seen we're seeing the events uh, uh, happening in Ukraine, but also the Russian population is a target of these of these tools of these methods. Uh, I mean, the, the the law is being used also at the domestic level to actually keep the Russian population, the Russian opposition, uh, under control. So it, it has an international dimension, but also a domestic dimension uh, tied to the control over the uh, by by the Kremlin over the Russian society. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, uh, I know this is a, a small, you know, small print, and it's you know difficult to see here. But you know, of course, you will have access to an ac access to a presentation. You can download it. Um, the main point here, the main, the main kind of rationale of, of what this is, it's a table uh, that, in my opinion, visualizes uh, and tries to to uh, to analyze what actual lawfare looks like, um, as opposed to the, uh, I mean, a, a, as an intersection with the domains of hybrid warfare. So if you if you look uh, at the at the top, you'll see all the various domains: political, you know, economic, uh, military, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of, of hybrid. And then on the left side, in the call, the, the left call, you see the different areas of the law. So you have international legal theory, international humanitarian law, you have maritime law. You know all the possible uh, domains of the law that we that people study uh, in in uh, you know in, in law schools. Uh, and of course, this can be expanded to include many many other. Um, many, many other areas, but this is just for for the purpose of, uh, you know, initially presenting kind of like an overall picture of, of what lawfare is. And so when you look at those, uh, some of those most important domains, uh, many of them uh, uh, really pose a serious challenge to the, to the security architecture in Europe. Why? Well, let's look at, for example, international legal theory, how it intersects with politics. Um, the Russian Federation has been uh, May, uh, has been uh, insisting from, from day one, not only during this war, but back in 2013, 2014, when it annexed Crimea, its main justification has been that uh, um, the, the principle of uh, self-determination, the, 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 the fictitious Russian nation in Crimea, for example, had, had this principle of self-determination has to, 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 to trump, to dominate over the principle of Ukraine's sovereignty. So in their view, uh, if there is a population that they, they can consider uh, to be Russian, then those people have the right of self-determination, which goes against and, and must be stronger uh, in, in terms of international law um, compared to the principle of, so of state sovereignty. So this, of course, pose, poses dramatic uh, uh, challenges, not only for Russia's neighbors, but for imagine all these countries that have, have minorities in various uh, neighboring states. You know, if this principle becomes a norm, the international system will collapse. Every every neighbor will start, you know, claiming uh, pieces of territory from from their own, uh, from their from their um, uh, regions, and this, of course, poses uh, a major challenge. Uh, of course, uh, history. You know, I know, of course, that um, you know, uh, you as as uh, uh, as people who know, uh, you, know you 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 come you come from the country with the richest history in Europe, so history is near and dear to you. Um, unfortunately, uh, Russia has been using history also as a weapon, as a hybrid uh, warfare weapon. And of course, uh, all these claims that the Russians and the Ukrainians are one and the same nation, uh, etc. You know, Kiev, you know, and, all, and Crimea, and all the historical references Putin has been making, all of these also have legal implications. So they're not only propaganda, but they actually have specific legal uh, uh, legal uh, justifications of being built uh, on top of those uh, historical. Uh, claim. So here is an example of how uh, the law intersects with history, with science, and then with uh, with propaganda to create this really, uh, um, a, you know, really poisonous mixture of, of, of Russian hybrid warfare. And of course, there are many, many examples um, 
you know you can you can later on take a look at the table if in, if, if interested my 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 whole idea my whole my goal here is to motivate to stimulate people to actually um de develop it even more so we can actually map russian head warfare uh, welfare in a more consistent fashion uh, let's go to the next slide please yeah um why is the russian uh, use of international law um you know also dangerous of course we all know that international law is meant to regulate conflicts you know to to um to achieve uh, peace treaties you know negotiate uh, uh, you know post-conflict resolution etc uh, unfortunately as my professors at fletcher used to tell me or, or teach us all um international law is not uh, uh, is not set in, carved in stone it is quite uh, fluid sometimes uh, and unfortunately, if um, if powerful actors in the international system, such as Russia, such as China, and others, if they keep pushing hard enough, uh, they will they might be able to change a certain legal uh, uh, legal concepts, uh, um, you know, legal legal practices in, uh, de facto, uh, and then and then and then the, over the course of many years, uh, their their hope is that this can also become a de jure, uh, you know, this can this could become um, also part of of, inter of the customary uh, international law, which will be a great, uh, again, a great danger for the international legal system. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you know, Russia has many, uh, many uh, techniques that they use. They uh, they use uh, various legal loopholes, you know, the uh, in, in international agreements, uh, which supposedly allow them to to to, um, for example, exercise a large number of troops. Uh, you know, as you all know, before the war, there was a major Russian and Belarusian exercise, which then evolved into this uh, uh, military aggression. So unfortunately, they have been using loopholes in the uh, OSC documents in order to to actually uh, practice and exercise with uh, with a huge number, tens of thousands of troops. Uh, now, uh, some people may ask why are the Russians so good at, at, at lawfare? Well, m many of their decision makers have actual legal background, even Putin himself technically you know has a has a law degree uh, medvedev is a lawyer you know lavrov is you know obviously an expert in international law and diplomacy so um the, the whole point is that they everything that they try to do uh, uh you know with all the illegal actions that they take they always try to make it look legal they always try to wrap it in some legal legalistic language to make it look as if uh, uh as if they're on the defensive as if they're defending and protecting their interests and, and, and in the West or Ukraine or somebody else is actually uh, the aggressor. So they're actually only responding to, to what the West and NATO is doing. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, again, a quick uh, rundown of the, of the uh, Russian experience in that. So 1654 is when, when the Russian uh, Tsar uh, signed a, um, a treaty with the Cossack um, Hetman um uh, about the Khmelnytsky uh, to you know to protect the the Cossacks uh, against the against the Poles unfortunately you know this this treaty served as a, as a pretext for the Muscovite it wasn't even Russia at the time it was Muscovy so the Muscovite forces occupied eastern Ukraine after that and then this continued with uh, with Katrin uh, in the 18th century now if you look at the document to the to the right it's in uh, written in 18th century Russian it's signed by Catherine the Great uh, and it's an explanation. It's the edict, um, the edict of, of Catherine uh, on the annexation of Crimea of, in 1783. That's the 19th of April, 1783. I sometimes joke that this is the birthplace of, and the birth date of Russian lawfare. Uh, in this edict, Catherine explained to the other uh, monarchs of Europe why the Russian Empire had to annex Crimea, and why am I, why am I using it as an example? When you look at the text, the way she frames the whole uh, the whole uh, annexation is that um, uh, Russia doesn't want to annex it, but they have to to, to do it to protect the people in the in the Crimea. So it's 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 interesting that that 250 years ago, uh, the Russian empress, who was actually of German descent, used the same justifications that Putin used in 2014 and and and, and in 2022 that they actually have to, that they are forced to actually step in and protect the people in in Crimea, in the Donbass, etc. So this is this is something that the Russian Empire has been doing for you know two and a half centuries, three and a half centuries as a matter of fact. And then the Soviets were also doing similar things and using similar uh, justifications. Uh, and of course uh, nowadays the Russian uh, leaders are using 
using these examples from from uh, from two or three centuries ago. So that's why you know they, they've really they've really mastered this game of warfare uh, quite well. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, uh, some of the examples are called is the creative bending of international law. I mean, they we tend to say that Russia breaks international law, and it's true they break it, but they never uh, admit. Uh, to breaking it, well, what they say is that actually they, they they follow international law, but they just reinterpret it. So it's it's really like forcing it, uh, twisting it, and bending it. Really, it's uh, that they would never hear hear from them that they actually broke the law. They always claim that there is an alternative legal uh, viewpoint, or just like there is an alternative uh, information viewpoint, and therefore uh, they always claim that they act in accordance with international law. And so, <clears throat> for example, to the right. You see passports. These were passports that were given away to uh, to pe the people in Donbas, and they were, um, you know, either Russian passports or local passports. Who um, uh, so the people would take them, and and then they the, the Russian state would claim that okay, now we have citizens, Russian citizens there that we need to protect. So the so the Russian army, they claim, has a responsibility to protect Russian citizens abroad, and the simplest way to create Russian citizens is to occupy a territory and then give away passports or, or vice versa give away passports and then claim like in in south ossetia hey we have russian citizens we need to step in and send the army to protect them so <clears throat> i know it sounds very simple and, and very i mean almost uh, it's an offense to the to our collective intellects in the west but it actually works and and uh, you know it's difficult to counter it uh you know when the russians frame it as a as a quasi legal um uh, step and then, of course, there's the accusations of Nazism. You know, <clears throat> we all know that Russia keeps insisting on denazifying Ukraine. Of course, it's absurd. You know, having, you know, with Ukraine having a president of Jewish descent to say to claim that it's a Nazi country, but you know, in, in Russian propaganda, everything works uh, uh, this way. You know, absurdity has a, has a has a role to play in this alternative legal reality. So they've been using this uh, Soviet uh, symbolics, you know, anti-Nazi symbolics extensively. Uh, to to actually delegitimize uh, both Ukraine but also the Baltic states and others in Europe, just to show that they are actually, uh, you know, taking illegitimate, uh, uh, you know, adopting illegitimate laws, or uh, you know, just to show to the international community that those states are uh, not, uh, you know, um, pro-Nazi, which is ridiculous. But you know, the, it also has a legal dimension. This this entire claim, um, and there, and of course the. Uh, the, the tactic that they use, uh, the humanitarian interventionism. So um, every time they they uh, they attack a nation uh, and take away uh, a piece of their territory, uh, be it Moldova or Georgia, and then and then of course Ukraine, then they also claim that they're launching a humanitarian operation and they're you know sending convoys supposedly with humanitarian aid, uh, which of course transports. Uh, uh, military equipment and, and material, but, but the claim is that it's a humanitarian uh, effort. So again, everything is wrapped in some kind of quasi-legal justification uh, of their illegal steps. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, so kind of like the big picture. So this, <clears throat> what, what's happening in Ukraine doesn't stay in Ukraine. Unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, the Black Sea is an area where, where the Russians started testing their uh, legal lawfare um, doctrine and practice, and uh, from the Black Sea, they were able to actually reach up to the Arctic, uh, an area which, of course, is uh, adjacent to uh, territories uh, controlled by NATO, obviously Norway, Denmark, you know, Canada, the U.S. Uh, so um, the the Russians in the Black Sea used to control only 14% of the of the uh, uh, sea. Uh, you know, you the coastal line. You see the brown portion and then the when they took over Crimea they actually expanded uh, the de facto control it's not a de jure control but they, there is a de facto control uh, and and then and then they can based on this they can close uh, portions of the sea of uh, the Black Sea you know what's happening now that they're even shooting at international uh, ships uh, in the Black Sea and uh, they have actually sunk one of those because they claim legality they have they claim legal control over over those areas adjacent to to their occupied territories, and uh, a similar a similar game is being played in the Arctic, where they're claiming an expanded um, jurisdiction and uh, and uh, exclusive economic zone based on a loophole in 
in the United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, of the law of the sea uh, Provision 73, allows them to claim that uh, because they believe the under, underwater shelf under the uh, Arctic Ocean is an extension of Eur the Eurasian landmass. Therefore, they, they're trying to prove that they, they need to control additional 200 miles, uh, sorry, 200 kilometers almost, in, uh, you know, of the Arctic Sea, which is a huge portion that, con that contains carbohydrates and, and other resources. And of course, <clears throat> this can trigger, of course, a conflict, uh, even war, an Arctic war, if you will, with NATO in the future. They're already forcing the ships that go there to, to accept Russian pilots. I mean, and they're acting as if they have legitimacy, legitimate control over this entire area. So again, what started in Ukraine will not stay in Ukraine. They, they, all, they tested there and that they expand in various global regions, which of course poses a threat to the uh, global security system. So let's go to the last, I think the last slide. So again, what are the implications for the international system of what we're talking? <coughs> of course, lawfare is, is quite a, a, um, a quite a cunning tool in the sense that, uh, as I said, mo many people don't think about it as, as part of lawfare, of, of uh, with hybrid warfare. They think it's something that's more, maybe unrelated to that, but, but unfortunately it's been weaponized. Uh, something because of this, it goes under the radar quite often and, and few people, few analysts actually think of the law uh, in those terms. Uh, now, the good, the good news is that um, lawfare cannot remain secret because the Russians need to justify uh, their, um, their activities. They need to justify their invasions and illegal acts. And so they need to actually publish something, uh, a quasi, uh, quasi uh, legal uh, document that actually can show us in which direction they're, they're gonna go. Ultimately, I mean, yeah, in order to justify the sending of troops somewhere like in Ukraine, uh, you, you don't just use, it, use propaganda. You have to you know, also use a quasi legal Justification, like for example, refugee, the refugee crisis, humanitarian crisis, uh, for the protection of some of some uh, population there. So, if, when they publish this, when they, <clears throat> uh, for example, recognize uh, the Donbas, uh, the you know the republics there, uh, we knew that they're preparing also a military action. So, so you can see things in advance, uh, and of course. Uh, the kind of the key here is that when you negotiate with Russia, you, th you have to think of, of, it, of those negotiations as a multi-dimensional chess game, because they're always looking several steps ahead, and uh, you have to be very careful what you sign, uh, because uh, even even the way the um, the provisions in a in a treaty or in an agreement are being prioritized uh, from one to say twelve, for example, the Minsk agreements, um, the Russians always say. Well, we will we will um, comply with you know the last provisions, but let let Ukraine comply with provisions one through ten, like the elections, uh, you know, amnesty for the for the pro-Russian fighters, etc. And then we'll you know, continue with ten and eleven, which is closing the border on the you know between the two countries. So even even some such, such technical details, you know, actually serve as a as some legal arguments that are very very strong uh, on the Russian side. So we have to be very careful. Let's go to the last the recommendation slides. <coughs> All right, uh, what I'm proposing here, and I've been talking about this for several years, and I have friends at NATO and elsewhere, um, that we need to create a lawfare or counter lawfare center of excellence. As you know, there are various centers of excellence within NATO, on centers on Intel, uh, cyber, energy, et cetera, et cetera. And we need one to counter uh, you know, the malign exploitation of the law or lawfare. Uh, it can be done for think tanks, it can be done for universities. Uh, and and the, beautiful, the beauty of the idea is that every nation has its own legal problems with, with, with Russia or with some neighbors. Then, then every nation can actually study its own, its own examples, its own experience, and then contribute to this uh, NATO uh, uh, or international center that would take care of, uh, of you know, analyzing, compiling this information and, and, and providing recommendations to, to the NATO uh, nations. Uh, and so, you know, there will be, of course, U Ukraine, Ukraine, the Baltic states could be in the lead in terms of providing information, you know, because they can read and, and translate from Russian, etc. But of course, uh, we can also have a, a center like this somewhere in Europe uh, to actually uh, support these uh, counter lawfare uh, uh, efforts. And then uh, academic programs at various universities actually uh, 
one is starting now in uh, Lithuania and Vilnius at the European Humanities University. This is my kind of my uh, baby, if you will. You know, I was pushing them. Uh, I've been pushing them for a couple of years, and they're going to start uh, next year. Uh, so this is uh, some good news, and hopefully other universities will follow suit. And of course, funding needs needs to be you know uh, to be identified. But I'm sure in this current situation, uh, there will be enough funding for. Uh, any programs of study or what Russia has been doing in order to counter it successfully. So this is the last thing that I'll say before the questions. Let's go to the very last slide. Uh, it's actually a short video. I don't know if you can. Uh, uh, I don't know if you can play it. Uh, you know, I don't know if you can at all hear what it says. If not, I'll explain after it's done. I know it's it sounds funny, but. What this is is it's a it's a very short 15 sec 15 second segment from the Star Wars, in which the Emperor of the Galactic Empire says that he's being asked, uh, okay, uh, you know, he says send the send the troops to attack, and then the he's being and they ask him, is that my lord, is that legal? And he says, I will make it legal. The reason I show this is not to make people laugh, but because this is the name of the game of what Russia and others have been playing. They they always try to make it all look legal. And they're quite good at that. And then we need to counter it. Uh, otherwise, the international legal system, uh, the legal or in the security order will actually uh, start unraveling under the pressure of these uh, lawfare, uh, lawfare uh, tricks, really. So with this, you know, I'm open to any questions. And then after that, I have to leave and, and, and go to Western Ukraine, if you don't uh, mind, uh, Marius. But I'm open to any questions for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, absolutely, sir. I, I don't see Maxilia. There you go. There you go, Maxilia. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me just have a look. Uh, yes, there is a. There, there are some questions. Uh, the first question uh, comes from uh, Cyril uh, Wider Chauvin, uh, and is uh, how do they see weaponization of energy inside of military? strategy uh, you mean how how the russians see the weaponization of energy yeah yeah, yeah it's 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 uh, i mean it's quite obvious uh, that uh, russia has been pushing to um uh, to, to launch uh, um you know north stream 2 obviously uh, for quite some time and and it's obvious that they chose the moment of attack when they actually thought that north stream 2 and germany uh, that germany was going to certify uh, North Stream 2 and, and let, let the gas flow, at which point Ukraine will be isolated. Uh, you know, the Russian energy would fly, uh, would flow through, through North Stream 1 and North Stream 2. And so, <clears throat> so energy is, uh, is, is part of this. Uh, also, um, also, it can be weaponized by claiming, for example, that um, uh, like there are specific examples uh, in the Baltic Sea, the Russians were claiming that um, uh, some NATO ships uh, are threatening uh, Russian, uh, yeah, the Russian pipeline. I mean, the sorry, the gas pipeline, and therefore they need to they need to protect it. So you can uh, you can use energy in, in a grand strategy sense to weaponize, weaponize it, but also even in a tactical sense. If there is a if there is a Russian gas or pipeline, they can. Uh, they will always claim that they need uh, to be protected, or they can create some some, some fake uh, accident. Uh, some 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 they will get they can launch some attack in order to engineer to fabricate a pretext and then come and actually um, uh, establish control over this area in, a, in a, you know through military forces. So this is these are some of the tools that they that they use to weaponize energy. Thank you. Uh, the second question uh, comes from uh, Robert Cutler and is uh, in view of Chinese attempts to restructure okay. the international legal order yeah. to its own advantage. Have you noted any cooperation between Russia and China regarding lawfare initiatives, either in general or uh, in particular? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, as you all know, China has those three wars, uh, uh, three wars strategy, and one of which, one of which is lawfare. Uh, they are they are also quite cognizant of uh, the power of international law, and I mean, you all know quite well that they're they have been building those artificial uh, islands on top of those reefs in the South China Sea, uh, and then again, it's a very simple, uh, even simplistic 
a tool. You go and you build a an, an, an air, or, you know an airfield on top of a reef, and then you turn it into an artificial island. And suddenly you claim that you know it, you have an exclusive. You have a you have a uh, territorial claim around that island, and of course some an exclusive zone, uh, which of course is, is is viewed as an aggressive act by by the China's neighbors in in, in the China South China Sea. I would say that. Uh, uh, you know, they've been coordinating, uh, let's say, let's put it that way, they've been learning from each other. You know, as I said, what, something was tested in Ukraine and then, then it's tested in the South China Sea. They both use uh, lawfare extensively, uh, up from the high strategic level at, at the UN and down to tactical, the tactical level. Uh, and, you know, let's not forget that uh, before uh, Putin launched his aggressive war against Ukraine, he went to China. And he met with uh, with uh, the Chinese uh, leader Xi, and therefore, I mean, the, co the coordination is uh, happened actually, you know, before our eyes. I mean, really, before launching an aggressive war, uh, Putin and Xi actually uh, coordinated. Uh, you know, I, I would also imagine coordinated the uh, legal and lawfare aspects uh, that 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 could that could uh, that could be used. I think what Putin pro most likely promised to Xi is that he would take over Ukraine in a couple of days. If this had happened, I would imagine China would have also tried to do something with regard to Taiwan or expand its interest in the South China Sea. Now that Russia is, is you know, effectively not winning, and, you know, I think losing the war in many ways, the Chinese have become very, very, of course, concerned and, and more careful. But but I think uh, a, a level of cooperation existed, you know, uh, including on, on lawfare. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Voiger, for your uh, insights. Um, I will have to, to give the floor to our second speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Gela Beshuasvili, if uh, I pronounce it uh, well, uh, former, mi former Minister of Defense and uh, Georgian Strategic Analysis Center um, uh, Associate. Please. Have the floor. Uh, yes. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, um, thank you for inviting me to be among this uh, distinguished audience. I also would like to um, congratulate Marius with the start of Strategy International. I think this is a, one of the first events of the uh, think tank that I'm very enthusiastic about uh, because uh, the uh, the recent events, especially, and in the war in Ukraine, uh, proved, uh, Marius, our initial uh, thoughts about the necessity of having uh, such institutions. Um, and as many as we have, uh, uh, better will be for, uh, for, for everybody to better understand what is going on around us. And what Mark now brought into the discussion is really uh, fascinating. And I'm um, I haven't thought about it because, you know, we, we uh, the topic of our discussion uh, was shaped to talk about the, the Europe and the crossroads uh, of the security architecture in Europe. But I'm very glad that the mark brought this issue of, uh, of lawfare. Uh, being a lawyer myself, you know, I'm a <clears throat> graduate of a Kiev uh, diplomatic institute. So this is a Soviet times uh, diplomacy, uh, diplomacy and international law school. And I graduated that school uh, was exactly uh, at that time. Uh, that was exactly the uh, the idea to prepare a diplomatic corps of Soviet diplomats to be able uh, to fight on the battlefields of the international law, uh, defending the uh, at that time uh, the Soviet uh, concepts and values of international relations. And I totally agree with Mark that uh, that uh, they are very good in this. You know, uh, they are very good in. Um, they used to be very good. I will tell you why they are not as good as they used to be during the Soviet Soviet times. But uh, the concept of uh, lawfare, uh, bringing international law into the play um, is, uh, is a very good idea. I would uh, later on talk to, uh, to Mark about, uh, about uh, this uh, idea to create a center. This is a, this is a fantastic idea that will find a lot of support. Uh, because there is a lack um, globally, uh, on a, on a, especially on the Western uh, countryside, to counterpart 
uh, uh, Russian and Chinese uh, um, international law attempts to justify uh, or to uh, you know uh, uh, to justify or to create illegal grounds for actually illegal actions. So um, um, I'm uh, I, I would like to offer you a couple of thoughts as being a practitioner. I'm not an expert uh, and don't pretend to be an expert on the subject matter, but I am a practitioner. I spent um, many years working in an international arena uh, as a diplomat. Uh, um, I was also beside the Ministry of Defense. I also was a foreign minister for uh, some time of Georgia uh, in, the, in a very uh, difficult period of time. It was 2004, 2008. Uh, right before the war and after uh, in Georgia, and what is happening today in in Ukraine and a war in Ukraine, I do believe that it will shape uh, the future of the not only European architecture, but it will shape a future of the global world order, because because what we are witnessing now is uh, is. Uh, is the fact that the global security architecture is broken. Is broken. I mean, um, uh, one of the fundamental things in international law, whatever you do, how good you are, uh, how skillful you are in a, in, a, in a drafting the treaties or um, or uh, drafting international legal instruments, the core. Uh, in this business is your trustworthiness. Is is how trustworthy you are. So the Russia today, in my opinion, has lost credibility and trustworthiness as an international actor uh, acting in a good faith. You can lose the loopholes. Uh, as a skillful lawyer. You know, you, you need to find the loopholes and try to avoid the, and try to negotiate the best deal for, for you, for your country, for your interest. It's okay. But when you are losing your credibility as international actor by lying, lying and lying again, you know, the massive propaganda machine that is based on a um, false information, disinformation campaign, these are now uh, tools are being used by, by Russia. And uh, we should not forget that Russia is a, is a permanent member of Security Council. And what we're witnessing now, um, and uh, it's my experience, you know, I used to work in the UN, I used to um, participate in uh, Security Council uh, meetings. Uh, the Security Council now is important. And uh, the last, uh, uh, meeting uh, on uh, war in Ukraine and uh, an and ability to uh, to adopt the resolution of the Security Council um, uh, stopping the war because of the veto power. I mean, this this uh, this organization is in deep trouble because the big players, especially Russia, are uh, misusing their uh, their power in that in these organizations. Um, what we are witnessing now, um, and uh, Marcella very eloquently uh, put the topic of our discussion today, uh, the European architecture, Europe on the crossroads. I would say it's not a crossroad. It's a, it's a broken, it's a broken system uh, that, uh, that uh, needs uh, urgent repair. Uh, and what is going to happen in Ukraine within the next two weeks? Uh, I do believe that it will shape greatly what kind of security architecture we are going to have in Europe and globally, because we do have a global players already on a scene in uh, in uh, in Ukraine. You have a um, uh, you have a U.S. Uh, actively participating, doing rightly so, in supporting Ukraine in their fight for freedom and for their homeland. You have a China that is, um, that is, let's put it mildly, observing as of yet, observing the floor um, and, uh, and not intervening, 
uh, but they are observing But the next two weeks. I do expect the China uh, would come up with kind of a part their participation and we, we can discuss and guess what kind of participation that will be. But um, we have indeed a situation when the global order is in great danger. There is no order, That's, that, let's put it lightly. There is no order. You know, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, uh, reaction do we have to prevent the war that is going on? The people are dying as we speak now. Uh, where are effective mechanisms to stop it? You know, where is the OSCE with a consensus-based uh, decision? Where are principles of 1975 Helsinki Act? You know, uh, the Mark put it uh, very, very rightly that Russia is using international law, international mechanism whenever they need them, in which form they, they, they uh, try to present them. So I bet a group of international lawyers and diplomats in Russia now are working and probably shaping uh, their uh, international legal version of the aggression against Ukraine. And I bet that since, uh, since um, uh, their argument of starting um, intervention, and they call it special operation, they even did not declare legally uh, the war. They didn't declare a legally war inside the country for many reasons, uh, uh, including for the international law reason as well. Um, because there are some, some obligations that you need to take and they didn't want to take this obligation. That's, that's how I read it. Um, so they, uh, they now are preparing the legal um, instruments, how to justify their intervention uh, to the international community. Of course, it depends on uh, outcomes of this uh, adventure, of this aggression. Um, uh, the Ukraine tried to use uh, all international mechanisms and terminology, definitions that matters in international law. Being a national lawyer, I know how definitions matter. Definition of aggression was brought into discussion um, during uh, the uh, last session of the United Nations Security Council. And guess what? The Russians have their own interpretation of the definition of the aggression that is in the Charter of United Nations. Um, bluntly, absolutely bluntly, uh, uh, denying um, the very, very simple facts. And uh, by the way, uh, the Soviet Union contributed a lot into the drafting of the definition of aggression from the positive perspective at that time. Um, uh, the, the war in Ukraine is not about war against Ukraine only. Uh, Russians made it very clearly uh, that this is a war against the West. This is a war against NATO, against the US. Uh, Ukraine is just a battlefield. Uh, just yesterday, I quote what uh, their propaganda machine was saying and actually basically what Minister Lavrov um, repeated during his, uh, his um, uh, intervention in, in Antalya recently, they said, Ukraine is just a milestone in securing strategic security, strategic security of Russian Federation. So it's just a milestone that the Russia will not stop on Ukraine, that the target is totally different. So, here is, is a point that I would like to make. So what we are talking about is a war, not between two countries. It's a war of, if you wish, of two civilizations. This, this is a civilization of democracy, of freedom, of values, different set of values, and the, and the civilization that is, that is called sovereign democracy, that Russia tries to, try to possess themselves as a sovereign democracy. They even don't call them authoritarians or, uh, or uh, any, anything else. So it's a class of civilizations that we are witnessing. It's a, it's a war between two, uh, between, uh, between uh, uh, two different set of values um, that, that do not match. And I'm, I'm, I'm very um, 
I'm very sorry that we all, Russians and us as well, and the West did not learn the lessons uh, of the very recent past. You know, I represent the country, Georgia, uh, that was uh, subject uh, of, of Russian attack in 2008. So the lessons after 2008 uh, intervention into Georgia are being copy paste in 2014, copy paste in 2022, you know, nothing new, nothing new. What the mark has listed as a, as a international, uh, international law tools being used to justify aggression, uh, passportization, you know, protection of Russian minority, protection of Russian language, um, you know, uh, borderization and also we all, we all have gone through it in 2008. We were appealing to the international community at that time to understand what the Georgians were about to say. We haven't been heard. Then 2014, annexation of Crimea happened. There was a reaction, quite a, quite a reaction from the West, but not enough to stop Russia for another adventure, more brutal adventure than what we're witnessing now in, in Ukraine. So that means that the legal, not only legal, but security architecture in Europe uh, needs to be restored. And I don't know the recipe how yet, because I try to, I try to analyze what is wrong with existing security architecture institutions. What is wrong with the Helsinki Act? I reread it 10 times and I couldn't find the hurdles there, actually. It's a good document. It's a good document. It can be updated, but in essence, it's a good document. Um, I, I throw uh, the OSCE um, uh, mechanism uh, again and again, I think they are all okay, they need to be updated, they need to be maybe adapted to the new realities. But, uh, but the problem is not in the documents, not in the, that established system. The problem is of, uh, of a behavior of the major actors. And, and here, uh, here is a, here is a um, uh, suggestion that um, many of, uh, of uh, experts now are uh, saying, let's, uh, let's engage uh, Russia into the dialogue. Uh, uh, you know, the security in Europe is impossible, is unimaginable without Russia. I mean, there is some, uh, there is some logic in what they say, but I don't see this leadership of Russia uh, being able to be engaged in a positive um, uh, dialogue or positive uh, new move to create a new architecture in Europe or, or globally. I, I just don't see it uh, because they have chosen a different way. They have chosen the way that Mark mentioned, historic way, do it and then justify it. So, they are now, they, uh, and I, <clears throat> I also, it's, it's a difficult uh, to, to imagine and to predict how, how the situation will eventually end up in Ukraine. But whatever happens, whatever outcome we have, the Russians will have their own um, uh, legal justification of the outcome. They are working on it, they will present it, and they will, uh, they will then, um, uh, as an innocent uh, victim, uh, will present their own uh, vision of a new European or global uh, architecture that is broken not because of their actions, but because inability of the West to listen to their security concerns. That's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be presented. And, and that's how everyday Russian propaganda is selling the news to their own people that the NATO is waging a war against Russia. And NATO hasn't even acted as an organization in Ukraine. Yes, they are supporting Ukraine. The, the, the war is being waged by Russia 
by, by Ukraine themselves, not by NATO. But that is being circulated again and again uh, uh, with a propaganda machine in Russia. So what we are going to, uh, to, to witness um, will be, I think, uh, that uh, very soon, uh, very soon Russia will come up with a with the appeal to international community, let's sit down and negotiate a new security uh, architecture of Europe. Uh, there is a need of, uh, of it. Uh, you know, you cannot ignore Russia. Russia is a nuclear power. By the way, uh, the very recent, uh, very recent um, uh, attempts of Russia to indicate that there will be a, a nuclear, uh, nuclear war um, also uh, is being used in order to intimidate international community in order to show that they are serious and they need to be heard. Uh, their security concerns need to be heard. Uh, and the last resort uh, that what they have is, is a nuclear power. It's a very dangerous pattern. Uh, they are using uh, their um, last resort, so to speak, uh, last resort um, uh, intimidations to, uh, with a nuclear, um, uh, uh, nuclear power. And that uh, that's, uh, worries me because, because uh, it is a difficult really on one hand to imagine security stable, a sustainable security architecture in Europe, in the world without engaging Russia on one hand. On the other hand, question is how to engage this Russia? And this is a question that I don't have an answer yet. But I think with the, our common um, uh, efforts and using, especially using the um, strategy international um, uh, network that we are going to, to expand, I think uh, within the foreseeable future, we are going to have this question to be asked again and again. And, and we will try to find a solution. I will stop uh, now and I will take your questions and then I will come again. Uh, I will stay until the end of our uh, panel. Thank you, Mr. Bishwazvili, for your uh, thoughtful talk and uh, recommendations. Uh, I would suggest to take uh, one or two questions and then uh, to proceed with the, the, the next uh, speaker. So uh, the next question is, uh, where do private military companies like uh, Wagner fit? And it comes from um, Cyril um, Withershoven. Where they fit? Yeah. Well, uh, the Wagner is a, is a private military organization. It's, a, it's not a new, they are mostly, uh, mostly uh, their area of operation, as far as I know, is Africa and Libya. Uh, used to be Syria. Uh, now they are in Ukraine, at least part of this organization. It is state-sponsored uh, uh, military, uh, professional military units. It's a, they are state-sponsored. Um, it's, it's under Russian command. Uh, I mean, legally, legally speaking, Russians deny. They say this is a private company, but this private company is being uh, equipped and uh, uh, an extensive use of uh, uh, state resources. Um, is there. So um, uh, I don't know much about this organization, but uh, they, uh, they operate uh, in Ukraine uh, and their legal status, as far as I read, is uh, the private, private military um, organization. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the next question uh, comes from um, Dr. Yerasmus uh, Rodoseatos, assistant professor at the American University of the uh, Emirates. And it is uh, addressed uh, both to you and to uh, uh, Professor Voiger. And the question is, uh, how would it be possible to compromise Western underwater cables uh, as mentioned in the matrix of uh, prof, uh, Professor Voiger? Uh, and what's, uh, what's your take on this? Well, this is a this is a serious uh, issue. And by the way, this um, if if I don't know if I the, the, if I understood it correctly, if we talk about the um, about the cables transatlantic uh, uh, cables, uh, 
um, they are they have been threatened um, uh, on a several uh, attempts uh, by Russia. That's why there is an extensive um, exchange between the U.S. military and Russians about this. U.S. military warned the Russians many times. Um, there, there is an activity of uh, of Russian submarines, uh, Russian uh, fleet in Atlantic. Uh, in the search of it, they indicated that uh, one of the targets, um, uh, their targets, are those um, uh, cables. Um, uh, but you know that now cables, uh, in this circumstance, in uh, uh, taking into account uh, recent events, the issue with the cables. Is a, is a toy uh, comparable with the, the nuclear strike threats. <laughs> uh, so this is, a, this is a, it, it used to be. Now we have a bigger, uh, we have a bigger stakes and bigger uh, threats. And it, it worries me uh, greatly uh, how comes that the permanent member of the Security Council um, wages uh, 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 open aggression against the neighbor, impunity is here, and they indicate that they are impune, they are immune from all kind of uh, sanctions. Now, when the economic sanctions imposed against Russia, uh, Russia uh, feels a great um, difficulty in wrestling with the sanctions. And that's why, as of today, I read already uh, some voices in Russia saying that this, um, these sanctions are equal to economic war against Russia. And economic war against Russia has a consequence. And the consequence they mean, I mean, they are all indirect indications about again and again, uh, using, using intimidation of using um, um, uh, nuclear power. That's much more serious than the, than the cables, but the cables used to be uh, issue used to be a part of their in intimidation attempts before. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Beshwazvili. Uh, now I will give the floor to our third uh, speaker, uh, Professor. Konstantinos Arvanidopoulos, Professor of International Politics and holder of Karaman Lee's chair at uh, Tufts University. Professor Alvaritopoulos, you have the floor. You want me to go now or should I go after Padelis? Uh, I think that you could you could uh, start the, your your presentation. I can I can I can uh, I can uh, start first and then uh, okay. uh, I suppose that uh, Professor Alvaritopoulos will close the, the meeting. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay, first of all. Uh, let me uh, thank all the distinguished uh, speakers for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, it's actually a, a real pleasure to, to have you all uh, together. And uh, I also would like to thank the very good friend and colleague, uh, Mario Sefthiniopoulos, for uh, uh, the mobilization and uh, the willingness and determination to, to co-organize uh, this uh, event with Neapolis University Paphos. And I'm also would like wish to uh, I would also wish to 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 express to him uh, my all best uh, uh, wishes again for uh, his endeavor and for Strategy International, uh, whom we believe is going to be a great partners a great partner to um, our security international relations security and intelligence programs that uh, we are developing in Naples University Paphos. It's a great opportunity to, to participate in the public discourse. And eventually I would also uh, like to thank the other colleagues and uh, for, being, uh, for being here with us tonight. And of course, the, the attendees of uh, today's event. Um, okay. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, I believe that uh, the two previous uh, speakers, they did a very, very eloquent, uh, uh, not only introduction, but uh, an in-depth analysis in uh, both uh, the overall uh, political framework that is currently being developed 
uh, the reasons and the mobilization initiatives that have been undertaken by Russian Federation uh, in a historical context, which I think uh, helps us to very well understand uh, what is going on and uh, what can be the consequences of, uh, uh, of uh, the latest events. Uh, while at the same time, it was um, very interesting to, to see the, and to contemplate the, the, the broader meaning of uh, hybrid uh, war, uh, war uh, when we're considering the impact of international law and uh, Gela also very well exposed and uh, uh, analyzed uh, how it uh, how it works uh, in uh, in the current situation with uh, also exams from uh, from Georgia and the uh, current, current political events. Um, I I would like to I, I had I had in mind a structure when uh, when we started uh, this conversation, but uh, after the first two. Introduction. I mean, after the first two uh, speakers, I I thought that uh, Gela, I would like to become a little uh, provocative, and uh, this I hope will uh, <laughs> stimulate the, the discussion. Uh, so uh, okay, I I took um, uh, I decided to to do so after you, you said that. Uh, uh, it's going to be uh, a tremendous change uh, in uh, the so-called order, whereby, as you very well said, <laughs> actually there is no order. Uh, so, and uh, this this uh, makes me uh, really think uh, uh, what we really did not know, uh, and uh, what really we did not expect, and to what extent. Uh, the uh, unfortunate uh, latest events, uh, which of course lead to a human tragedy, uh, and of course uh, it will lead to to, to a change of uh, the security environment. Uh, to what extent these were not hidden issues, uh, actually hidden, uh, not well, excuse me, well-known issues, but hidden under the carpet. Uh, so uh, I'm trying really to I'm, I'm trying really to I'm trying really to think about uh, what uh, what we did not know. Uh, two weeks ago, I, it happened. I was in a very interesting uh, uh, conference uh, organized in Helsinki, organized by very good colleagues uh, of uh, Konrad and our Stiftung, and uh, there we discussed the uh, the impact of the non-aligned uh, of the non of of the non-aligned states. The six non-aligned states, uh, literally speaking, about Malta, Cyprus, uh, Ireland, Austria, um, um, okay, I will find the, the other two. Uh, so, what, what, what will, what will, what will be the impact uh, on the European defense architecture, and uh, also in relation to to NATO? And uh, quite interesting issues came forward. Uh, so, um, let me mention some of those. Uh, the, first, the first thing is how, how, how we neglect the very specific uh, geopolitical challenges that take place uh, in the region, uh, and uh, we do not really consider when we uh, attempt to analyze and to come to conclusions. So, let me easily say that uh, if we want, for example, Cyprus to get involved into the overall European defense architecture, and automatically this leads us also to NATO's uh, umbrella, then we uh, forget or we omit that easily uh, Turkey uh, exercises the veto power. So this means that whatever we, I mean, whatever the Cypriots are trying to do, and I'm only, I'm only referring to one example, uh, they will face the veto, the, the exercise of the veto power from the side of Turkey. So this automatically means that Cyprus, although very active country, very active state within the existing initiatives of the common, uh, the common initiatives at the, at the level of the European Union, at the defense level, on the other hand. At NATO level, 
uh, Cyprus cannot be uh, part of simply because Turkey is imposing uh, their own veto, their own veto on, uh, on any initiative undertaken by the side of Turkey uh, within the NATO framework. Uh, uh, let's see what has happened the, later, the last two years in relation, for example, to the um, exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, whereby we have seen a very harsh Turkish aggressiveness, um, which um, uh, has um, violated numerous, time, uh, numerous times international law. By this, what I'm trying to say is uh, that uh, we really have to see the insights of uh, not only the European defense architecture, but also of uh, the uh, European uh, geopolitical realities. What we didn't really know, we didn't really know that, for example, we have a huge dependency on, uh, on Russian natural gas. Uh, characteristically, uh, when we were doing our discussions two weeks ago in Helsinki, um, I said that, okay, uh, when, going back when I, was, when I was only 25, 26, I was doing my PhD, uh, in Sussex, and there I read that, I was reading that we have a dependency of 50, 60, 70% on natural gas and other uh, resources. And still, uh, only last week I saw, for example, that the case remains the same. And not only the case remains the same, but we also had to finance North, North Stream in order to facilitate the Russian gas to enter into Europe. So. In other words, it was not something well known to us. Of course, it was well known to us. Uh, and what we did about that, I would dare to say almost nothing. Uh, on the contrary, we financed uh, very interesting projects, infrastructure projects, in order to facilitate the same trend to go on and probably to, to get further increased and intensified. Additionally, what we did know, we did know, for example, that um, the Minsk agreement was under question. Of course we knew. And what we did in order to get the Minsk agreement materialized. Uh, and I don't want to, 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 to blame anyone for this. At the end of the day, what we are looking, we are looking to the facts. And suddenly, I mean, at the same time, what we did not really know, we did not really know that Russia and China were coming together. Of course, we knew and we know that Russia and China, they're coming together. Of course, we know that this is done mainly in economic terms, but not purely on economic terms, because we very well know that there are also political issues which had, had to get resolved before the economic reapproachment between China and Russia. So what is happening now, actually? Uh, and, and of course, I can, I can put forward some more questions uh, as well. Uh, only today, it was very interesting to, to listen to NATO Secretary General, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, saying, uh, uh, urging, urging uh, NATO's member to increase uh, their defense budget uh, up to 2% of, of their GDP. That, that happened today. Um, so, okay, what we really did not know, we did know this, issue uh, five years ago when President Donald Trump came to Europe and said that if you want us to pay for your defense, this is not going to happen. So you have to increase the budget. And so now this is something that is now happening. So what I'm trying to say is that I'm not sure whether we speak uh, about, uh, uh, about um, a, new, uh, a new order or we speak about the intensif intensification of a, a process that was already taking place, but for a lot of mainly political reasons or for reasons of uh, interest, let's say national interest, uh, those issues uh, which somehow are quite complicated were hidden under the carpet. And what is happening now in uh, Ukraine what is really uh, has, has an impact is actually to bring forward all these issues in such a way that cannot anymore be hidden under the carpet. Uh, so the European defense architecture and the issues 
that are related to the European defense architecture, A, political willingness, B, uh, uh, common security policy, but not only, support, not only policy, but at the same time, uh, operation, operational capacity. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, uh, the relationship between the European defense policy and the European defense architecture with NATO, uh, the issues of the non-aligned, non uh, uh, other issues which are including uh, the uh, Russia and China reapprochement, um, they, are, they, are they are brought forward in such a hectic way that cannot be hidden anymore. So the, so the answers have to be given and have to be, uh, have to be, have to be deployed uh, the sooner possible. Suddenly, we saw uh, Germany actually providing 100 billion euros uh, for, uh, for defense budget. Uh, we also see all this willingness and mobilization of, uh, of leaders towards the direction of uh, shaping um, a common architecture or at least to, to try to initiate uh, uh, joint, uh, joint actions. In the meantime, we also see, uh, a, a, I would dare to say, a, a, strange, uh, a strange objectivity of some NATO members, like Turkey, for example, uh, whereby we see that, uh, uh, I mean, they, they are providing military uh, equipment, uh, while at the same time, they speak also with the Russians. So we have to see how the different uh, specific uh, geostrategic and uh, national interests at the end of the day shape what we see now as a common vision. Because after Ukraine, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the unfortunate uh, uh, and the tragic events in Ukraine uh, come to an end, we have to see how these dynamics will uh, formulate or will create a new uh, security order. So what I'm trying to say is uh, that, uh, in, in my opinion, or at least uh, we have to think uh, if we speak about uh, a, a significant uh, change in uh, or shape in what we call world security order, or we speak about the intensification of existing forces which were there, but they were hidden under the carpet for various purposes. Now, why this is uh, why this is uh, uh, of uh, of a discussion, uh, it is of a discussion simply because it does not mean that uh, the two different approaches will have the same consequences and the same impact when uh, a new uh, security order is going to be uh, created. Because I'm not sure that whether we will, it's going to be a new world order to be created or something that was in place to, to get shape. Uh, the one is different from the other. In what way is something to be seen? Uh, I don't want to take more of your time uh, because I think that the other uh, two colleagues will also have to say more interesting things than I have to. But in any case, I will be uh, at your disposal if there is any uh, issue to be discussed. Thanks a lot, Marcelia, and uh, the floor to you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Vandelis Klaas. Uh, professor Vandelis Klaas is a professor of international political economy and rector at uh, Neapolis University, Papus. Uh, if uh, the other two speakers don't mind, I would suggest to give the floor first to uh, Professor Arvanidopoulos and then to Professor Epidemiopoulos and then to take uh, the questions from our uh, audience. So. I understand that uh, you have, uh, I have a positive uh, feedback. So, uh, Professor Arvanidopoulos, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation. Um, I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground. So uh, allow me to um, uh, contribute to the conversation uh, with a few headlines. 
I will start saying that um, I would agree with uh, Minister uh, Bejoasvili that um, uh, this is um, uh, this naked aggression on the part of Russia has more to do uh, with the um, uh, holistic revision of the post Cold War settlement, the, uh, the post Cold War status quo, um, uh, and it does not have to do only with Ukraine. Um, I think that um, uh, Mr. Putin um, never hided his aversion to the uh, post Cold War settlement. He was very vocal um, uh, about the um, um, uh, about Russia's dissatisfaction with the status quo, starting in Munich with his speech in Munich in 2007, and of course following up uh, with a series of aggression uh, in Georgia and and Ukraine in and Crimea in 2013. Uh, let me just say that um, uh, his policy in revising the uh, post Cold War status quo. Uh, is being implemented uh, uh, in, um, uh, in, a, in a design that has uh, three concentric cycles. The first cycle has to do with uh, the reconstitution of uh, the Russian spheres of influence in its near abroad. And, uh, and by that, um, uh, we can explain uh, Russia's aggression in Georgia, um, in, uh, in, of course, making a vassal state out of Belarus, and of course, with, uh, with what has happened in Crimea and with the total war now and the devastation uh, um, uh, against, against Ukraine. The second cycle has to do with Russia's effort to return in uh, uh, regions that the former Soviet Union exercised traditional power and influence, such as the Middle East, we saw that in the Syrian case, or the Balkans. And the third cycle, of course, has to do with um, uh, Russia's interference in the domestic uh, affairs of, uh, of our uh, Western democracies. And uh, we saw that in a number of issues, um, from uh, the Catalan issue to the Brexit issue to the US election of 2016. Now, uh, having said that, uh, let me start with Ukraine, and then uh, I will try to answer the question, why, they, why a total war and why now? And then uh, conclude with, um, uh, with a few thoughts about the uh, post-Cold War settlement. Um, uh, let me just say that, um, uh, again, I will agree with the minister that this uh, crisis, this war, this naked aggression, uh, is a watershed event, and uh, we will uh, we we are witnessing tectonic shifts in 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 uh, world order. Um, we we have the return of history. Uh, we are back to 19th century real politics with the use of uh, violence to the settlement of disputes, uh, with the threat of the use of violence, uh, with a violation of territorial integrity and national sovereignty. Um, so uh, all this uh, fallacy that uh, we had witnessed the end of history and uh, somehow the liberal order uh, would be expanded to the rest of the world, we, uh, we've come to understand that um, it was just that a fallacy, unfortunately. Um, let me, let me uh, make a few comments regarding uh, now Putin's narrative. Uh, Putin has constructed the false historical narrative. He has claimed that he, it's a narrative of demonization of the West and victimization of Russia. And the, 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 uh, the Putin narrative actually claims that the West deceived Russia regarding the expansion of NATO. Uh, that um, the West and especially the United States had promised Russia that um, uh, we would not not expand NATO to the east. Uh, and of course, we did quite the opposite. Um, and uh, for all intents and purposes, we turned the uh, doctrine of containment to a doctrine of encirclement of Russia. That's the Putin narrative. Unfortunately, this narrative uh, has resonated with some revisionist historians, even in the West, and some realists like uh, Mearsheimer, but also um, this great diplomatic figure, George Kennan. Um, uh, remember that Kennan in, uh, 
um, at some point in the early 90s, had argued, or in, in the 80s, I believe, um, had argued that the um, expansion of NATO to the East would be a strategic blunder. And of course, Mia Seimer, um, uh, whereas he's correct in pointing out that um, uh, international relations and international politics is a, a tragedy of great power politics. On the other hand, uh, he has attributed blame for this war squarely to the West. And so I want to take issue with, uh, with this narrative uh, for a couple of reasons. Now, the first reason is um, that the discussion uh, about the expansion of NATO to the East that uh, Putin refers to has to do with the beginning of the 90s, 1991, 1992, and it was related to the reunification of Germany. Any question about NATO um, as, uh, as it has been included in the uh, Baker memoirs and, and the memoirs of other practitioners that were involved, that were present that, uh, in the creation, so to speak, of the post-Cold War order at the time, um, they will tell you that anything that was discussed about NATO had to do with the reunification of Germany. Um, NATO's expansion was not in the cards at the time. Um, the issue of uh, the dual enlargement, the EU and NATO enlargement became an issue from the mid nineties and onwards. And it was not a process of an imperial design on the part of the West. It was a response to the demands of Eastern European and Balkan countries that, uh, that saw the, their accession into the European Union as a guarantee for their newly founded democratic institutions and their economic development and prosperity, and their accession to NATO as a guarantee for their security and safety. Uh, in 1998, I was on a fact-finding mission uh, in uh, Budapest, uh, Warsaw, and Prague, uh, the capitals of the first three countries to become uh, members of NATO after the post after the Cold War, and we had the opportunity to talk to practitioners, to talk to citizens, to talk to opinion makers, to talk to journalists. Um, this was a unanimous uh, demand that they become members of NATO. And to our questions, why did they want to become members of NATO? The answer was because of their fear of the prospect of a revanchist nationalist Russia. So the, the, um, the, dual, the, the dual enlargement and the expansion of NATO, it was not a part of the strategy on the part of the United States or the West, an imperial design to encircle Russia. It was a response to the demands of the, uh, of the countries that were liberated uh, by the Soviet Empire, from the Soviet Empire in the aftermath of the Cold War. And they wanted to choose freely their foreign policy orientation. And they chose to belong to the uh, transatlantic institutions. And, and of course, by, uh, we should not forget that um, uh, the, the main stake of the Cold War was to liberate those countries, among other things, to liberate those countries that had fallen behind the Iron Curtain. This was why we fought a 50-year Cold War. And so to accept those countries in the transatlantic institutions, it was a correction of history. Now, if if we want to go a step further and, uh, and, um, and um, hear the argument that some are making about Ukraine, Georgia, or even Belarus, for example, that um, uh, getting the former Soviet republics in, uh, within NATO may be a step too far, then we will have to respond to the existentialist questions that are being posed by the Georgians or the Ukrainians as we speak. And those existential questions have to do with a number of things. Um, 
Are nation states free to choose their foreign policy orientation? Yes or no? Are we, do we support and do we abide by the rules of Westphalia and the, um, and, and the respect of territorial integrity and national sovereignty? Yes or no? Uh, those questions need to be answered. And, you know, frankly, uh, those nation states uh, have answered those questions. Ukraine chose in 1991 with a great margin to have a Western foreign policy orientation. Then we had the Maidan Revolution. Ukrainians were accused that um, uh, the, the, there was the accusation that the Maidan Revolution was uh, instigated by the West. But we see today that Ukrainians are sacrificing their lives to support their, um, their choice, to support their, the, the, their right to choose. And so um, we need to, to be very frank when we discuss uh, foreign politics and, and international politics. Now, that's one thing. The second thing is that um, regarding NATO and, and, and Russia, I need to remind um, to, our, um, to our audience that um, the Russians are obsessed with Ukrainian statehood. Um, in, in, I remind you uh, the two famines uh, that Soviet Union instigated in Ukraine, Holomodor in the 30s, and then the second famine in the 40s by Stalin. Um, and, and the same thing we, need, we, we see today. Now, why today was the prospect of um, uh, Ukraine's accession to NATO uh, posing a threat, a security threat to Russia? This, was, this is something that um, the Putin narrative has told us. Was, was, was Ukraine posing a security threat to Russia? Was really uh, Ukraine posing a security threat to Russia? And, and if so, why, did we, uh, why, why didn't Putin uh, negotiate? Why didn't Putin negotiate with Ukrainians instead of uh, waging a total war and destroying the country, uh, the country of Ukraine? And was the, um, the prospect of entering NATO the real threat that caused this war? Because we all know that the prospect of, Ukraine's becoming, of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO was almost a dead letter since 2014. It was almost a dead letter since 2014. Even Merkel had uh, told Putin that there is no unanimity uh, among European member states of NATO about Ukraine's accession. So it was not an imminent thing to happen. Secondly, um, Putin has provided a number of justifications for this war, not, not, not just NATO and the, uh, and the uh, prospect of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. He told us that he is waging war because of uh, um, uh, he wants to uh, impose a process of denazification in Ukraine, uh, especially the Jewish Ukrainian leadership, I, I take it. He told us about the genocide, that he uh, is invading Ukraine because there is a genocide against us. Then he told us about um, the, um, the existence of uh, chemical and biological weapons uh, that have been implanted by the West. You know, um, Bismarck once said that um, the big lies are being said after hunting before the elections and during the war. And, and, and that brings me to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the second question, why now? Um, and, and, and there is where I agree with the minister. Uh, Ukraine is just part of his, uh, his design. His design is um, the um, total revision of the, of the status quo. And I think that um, 
he decided to go to war because he wanted to accelerate what he thinks in his mind that, that is the decline of the West. One of the reasons that he went to war against Ukraine was to accelerate the decline of the West, because he operated under the assumption that the West is in decline. And of course, the West uh, gave him all the pretext to, 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 to think that. I mean, after the Trump presidency, after the, the, the beginning of decoupling of the transatlantic space because of the catastrophic uh, Trump presidency, uh, remember that for uh, one whole term, for four years, Trump has been educating his public opinion that the Europeans, the European member states are America's enemies and Russia is uh, America's friend. Um, Trump talked about NATO being obsolete. Uh, and then, of course, he had in front of him a European Union in disarray, um, a, a European Union in, in polycrisis, um, in, in the sense that we had the Eurozone crisis and then the immigration crisis, and, and all the little uh, illiberal populists in Europe that uh, uh, were creating all sorts of, uh, of um, problems in, uh, when it came to European Union. For the, very, for the very first time in, in uh, the history of the European project, we had an exit of a member rather than a, an entry of a member, the, uh, the Brexit. So what Putin uh, uh, um, uh, thought and, uh, and operated under was the assumption that the uh, West is in disarray, the, the Americans are in decline, the Americans are pivoting to Asia, so Europe does not have geopolitical significance to them anymore. The European Union is maybe an economic giant, but it's a political and security dwarf. And, and NATO is obsolete or, as Macron uh, argued, brain dead. So I think in the back of his mind was, besides his obsession with Ukrainian statehood, um, was that he could accelerate the, uh, the decline of the West. Now, his second miscalculation, of course, was that um, once he amassed all these, uh, these all his armies um, uh, across the Ukrainian border, that uh, the Ukrainian people would capitulate and their leadership would flee to the West. And uh, once he invaded, um, uh, that didn't happen, of course. And, 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 and once he invaded, he thought that the same thing would happen, that uh, the Ukrainians would not fight. The Ukrainians would uh, receive the uh, Russian soldiers as liberators. And this uh, corrupt actor, as he calls him, uh, Mr. Zelensky, would, would flee to the West. This didn't happen either. So this is his second miscalculation, that um, the Ukrainians are fighting for their uh, right to choose, for their territorial integrity, for their um, freedom, for their democracy. So um, his miscalculations have brought him in a very difficult uh, um, position, um, because what he has achieved uh, with this war is to unite a very polarized American political system. Uh, anyone that um, witnessed the State of the Union address uh, would see that Biden got so many standing ovations uh, from Republicans that uh, it, it was getting annoying in the end. He, uh, he galvanized um, the transatlantic relations again. We have a recoupling of transatlantic relations again. He, um, he brought about unity in the European Union, and all these populist heretics have uh, drawn back to the fold. And also, of course, he has given a new raison d'etre to NATO. Now, NATO um, uh, uh, might have new member states. Uh, Sweden and Finland now want to become members of NATO. This is quite an achievement. This is really quite an achievement. Which brings me to the new security architecture. I think that um, uh, Russia uh, has become isolated. Uh, Mr. Putin has turned Russia to a, a, a pariah state. Um, if those atrocities um, uh, can be documented as war crimes, these severe economic sanctions will remain for a long time after the war. 
So the price that the Russian citizens are paying is uh, is 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 a huge uh, is a huge price, and I think that Mr. Putin is is cornered with the menu of very bad options in front of him. Um, I do think that uh, eventually he would be forced to negotiate. And but um, even 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 if he wins, even if he destroys Ukraine, this will be a pyrrhic victory. So his choice is between accepting defeat or a pyrrhic victory. Um, that brings me to the um, the security architecture. I think that the Americans understand one thing that um, their narrative about the decline in Russia was also false. Russia may be a decline a great power, but is a persistent revisionist great power that needs to be um, a force to be reckoned with. So the Americans do not have the luxury of pivoting to Asia to just face the, uh, the Chinese challenge. That means that we need a new Atlantic Charter. We need a new division of labor between the two sides of the Atlantic. A new Atlantic Charter with the Europeans increasing their defense expenditures, with the Europeans creating a common defense culture for the first time, with the Europeans uh, taking upon uh, more missions, with the Europeans um, playing a bigger role in Eurasia and uh, acquiring a bigger stake in the decision-making process of the alliance. That I think, I, I have used the term strategic complementarity. For many years during the Cold War, uh, Europeans were dependent upon the American security umbrella for their safety and their security. Now, mainly because of the catastrophic Trump presidency, the Europeans have gone the other way and have started talking about strategic autonomy. I think what we need to talk about is a period of strategic complementarity. The, the strengthening of the European defense identity within the Atlantic umbrella, within NATO, and a new division of labor between the two sides of the Atlantic. This is the new security architecture in the transatlantic space. Now, with as long as Putin remains in power, uh, we will have a new Cold War. Uh, we will have, the West will have a new Cold War as long as Putin remains in power. The destruction of a nation state in the 21st century cannot be accepted. The destruction, the naked aggression, the, the invasion and violation of territorial integrity and national sovereignty cannot be accepted for us especially because we know what it means. We, we've seen it in Cyprus and, 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 we, and we see it in the Aegean every day. It cannot be accepted. And so Russia will, um, will be a pariah as long as Mr. Putin remains in power. Now, the, the larger scheme of things that has to do with the polycentric state system, because we, the, the international system is a polycentric system. We all accept that um, after 9-11, um, the, the world uh, um, turned from a hybrid uh, unipolar kind of international system slowly to a polycentric system. And we have uh, those two powers and, 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 the, and the West needs to remain united. The West needs to remain united to face those two challenges at the same time. So I do think that when we are in the... Uh, uh, we have in front of us a new transatlantic, uh, um, uh, the need for a new transatlantic charter, and, um, and, um, and, and, and hopefully this, this war will end with no further destruction and loss of civilian lives. I'll leave it at that and we'll uh, get in the Q&A if there is. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Arvani Dobilus, uh, for your uh, thorough analysis and the explanation of uh, contemporary security challenges for the EU and um, NATO. 
Uh, I will give the floor now to uh, Professor Mario Sevlimiopoulos, who is uh, the last uh, speaker for uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Mercilia. Thank you, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope I'm not going to take too much and too long of your time. I would like to thank um, also uh, the rector of Naples University Paphos, Professor Skas, and thank you very much to our dear speakers today for joining us. Uh, His Excellency Gela Berazvili and my very good friend, Professor Avanitopoulos, thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, Mark, but also Mercilia for doing the moderation for this discussion, for this lovely discussion. And I hope I'm not going to take too long of your time. I know that some of you and most of you have other things to attend to, uh, but um, I, I want to concentrate more, if you want, on the necessity of the practical value of where we are today and where we're going. Throughout this speech, this, this, these speeches, we have heard a variety of, of, of topics. And I'll start with the legal element that was presented by Mark and the necessity to have a legal posture. We went to the operational and experimental, experiential, if you want, lessons to be learned by Kiela. Then we moved on with uh, Professor Padelis uh, Kiela by telling us, if you want, uh, with regards to European understanding, if you want, of the near broad and Professor Vanitoblos giving us, if you want, an insight uh, possibilities or a variety of possibilities with, re with regard to the European spectrum and you know, the, the European defense architecture that can come about. Now, I would like to concentrate on some more practical, if you want, issues, considering two things. Number one, and I've been noticing quite, quite for many, many years with regards not only to my visits to, to, to Russia, and also to Ukraine, I've been to Luhansk, Donetsk, I've been to Mariupol multiple times. I've, I've seen, if you want, the troublesome with regards to the economic insecurities of, of the region, not only the Russophones or the Russophones, friends, um, uh, the, the ones that could have actually started what started in 2014. But I was expecting that the Europeans would actually read, if you want, Putin in a different way. We have the tendency to understand Vladimir Putin as being one of the civilians, but he's not a civilian. He came from a deep Soviet state where the KGB was ruling Eastern part of the world and including, including also Eastern Germany. He's been there in operations multiple times. He has no feelings. He has no feelings. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't care about what people are gonna say. There are two reasons behind this. First of all, Russia is one eighth of the world's land. So Russia is a big country and it has all the natural resources that it needs to create or reshape, if you want, a new market economy, an internal market economy. And that's why he's playing a, a example, an example with uh, the market economy of McDonald's, if you want, with regard to what taking around the world, where he's nationalizing all private property and he's going to implement his own, if you want, chains of food in order to offer the Russian uh, civilians. Number two, he's utilizing very much the media. He, you see, the media in, in, in Russia was never free. And I think it was never free because Russia is quite big. And in order to be controlled, one has to play the oligarchic, if you want, uh, cards. And in fact, Russia has been run throughout the years with oligarchs. It has a democracy, obviously. It has a rule of law, obviously, uh, lower Duma, upper Duma, and so forth, and so on and so forth. But in fact, one gets the, the decision, if you want, from a top-down approach. And therefore, the oligarchs that have been doing uh, quite good work, whether this was in the Soviet Union or after the Soviet Union or in a post, you know, 2001, if you want, terrorist attacks, where all things changed and Putin was looking like the uh, partner, if you want, to the United States with regard to the, to the war against terror, everything seemed to be quite well. But in fact, he was planning ahead. He was planning ahead the, the, the remilitarization of his forces, the new space command, the new space forces, the new military forces, laser command, and he was learning from the best. And who was the best? the West, the European Union, and the United States. Always an intriguing place for the Russian oligarchs to, to invest, whether this was in London, in the UK, whether this was in the US, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately for him, things did not go as planned because Afghanistan was falling apart. And although they were helping a lot the Americans with regards to the counterterrorism activities, things were not going quite well. 
So what happened is that Putin implemented a new strategic plan, a plan that a lot of people wrote that we're not reading him well, which is not to really approach the European Union or approach NATO. In fact, even Putin said that there were discussions to, for Russia to actually apply for NATO membership at some point when he was having discussions with Bill Clinton, and that never happened. Now, what, what, we're, what we are seeing now is an implementation, a continuation of what started in 2014. It is not something new, but it also backdates us earlier. And let's go back to 2009 and 2011 also. We can go back to 2000 before, and I see Gela shaking his hand, where actually Putin was asking the, uh, the presence of the Russian fleet to increase. He asked that in 2009 and 2011, considering that he wanted to be in the near abroad. In fact, we did not understand the near abroad. I did not understand the near abroad until I went in 2014 in Migimo in Moscow and I lectured there. And actually the students were talking about the geopolitical strategies. And I was asking what sort of geopolitical strategy are we talking about? The lessons that they were learned by their teachers and therefore going later on to the government processes, they were learning for natural resources, natural lands, natural sea borders, where things are going to go, what are the natural resources that Russia may need. And in Ukraine, in fact, what Russia does is to secure its energy sufficiency, to secure its eastern front and free and cheap labor, because they need that, Three, they want to have the access to the Eastern Urals. So everything is gonna stop on the Dnieper River as long as they do not take Kiev. I still and strongly believe that they will not be able to take Kiev, but strategically they will take Odessa to probably point out if you want of strategic value, a city that has a lot of Greeks where the Greek independence basically started where uh, the European, if you want, identity is now at stake because Putin wants to make one thing uh, sure and very clear to the Western Europeans, that you never answered the question, does Russia belong to the European, if you want, structure or not? Now, unfortunately, the, the European members do not really answer until things happen. They say they are preventive in paper, but in practice, they're not. And we can see that if you ask Georgians, if you ask Moldovans, if you ask Swedes, if you ask the Finnish, if you ask the Cypriots, if you ask them, we do not react until things actually happen. And although we, we may be able to foresee those, we do not take action until this thing happens. Taking us and driving us back, if you want, to the legal prerequisites. What does NATO stand for today and what can NATO stand for in the near future? Um, I'm going to use the words of um, former Minister of Defense of the United States, Leon Panetta, and I had the pleasure to be in a group that I was listening a few hours ago um, in a joint group in the United States in D.C., where he actually said that his biggest fear is where does actually Russia stop? And I am of very much certainty that now we're talking about the split of Ukraine between the West and the East. In the worst case scenario, Luhansk, Donetsk, Crimea, and Odessa go for four entities independent. Now, in the new European architecture, we need to be aware of these things as they come because Moldova is fearful of Transnistria. Georgia is fearful of Abkhazia. And there are more things that might come in the Balkans, which we do not talk about it nowadays. And while there's war waging in Ukraine, Turkey is bombarding the Yabakir in the eastern part of Turkey. Two days ago, we saw Iran selling, uh, sending 12 missiles to Erbil, and there go, and, you know, peace goes bye bye. So we actually urgently need a European constitutional approach, a European policy approach probably a Berlin three, rather than Berlin plus, but rather Berlin three. And we need operational capacity of the armed forces to be able to secure and safeguard what is known as the European borders. The Euro-Atlantic borders are secure so far as nobody attacks NATO. And Putin will not attack NATO. He will not attack NATO land. He knows that. But he also knows that NATO will not even budge to enter inside Ukraine due to the fact that there is no legal justification. 
The only legal justification that can be used is against crimes against humanity or no-fly zones. You've been seeing the no-fly zones discussion has been done, especially knowingly uh, taking the knowledge from what happened in Libya in the recent past, where, however, there was a United Nations Security Council agreement. And in this case, there cannot be a United Nations Security Council agreement, exactly because it was said by the predecessing uh, discussants that Russia and, you, and China have been there, each other, and that have been helping each other for more than 50 years, especially in the United Nations Council Resolution. What does this mean for the European future? It means basically similarly to what Professor Van Doppel said, that we really need a European architecture that does far better. I'm going to take it a far. I'm going to take it a step beyond uh, to the complementarity of strategy, but rather we need an alliance that I called on my theories and my writings hybrid alliances, where in fact we pinpoint the short-term interests and the real important needs to secure a the market economy and the chain, uh, the blockchain, if you want. Of, um, of, of, of mass movement of goods. Number, th number three, the importance of security of the habitat and the ecosystem, whether this is analogic or digital, of the future Europeans are going to be at birth. Number four, energy security. Energy security, the energy security and the corridors that need to be reshaped, need to be reshaped fast before European countries become totally independent to each other. And Germany has pointed out this very clearly, that it wants to be totally independent by 2030, 2038 or 2030, I may do a mistake. But what I'm trying to say is the following. We are now at a very important crossroad where the European Union should A, look at its own members and actually see what's happening. Brexit, it was mentioned Brexit, and Brexit can only be the start. We have Hungary uh, looking left and right, and having very good relations or balanced relations both with Russia and the European Union and the foreign minister of Hungary was saying, I don't want any NATO troops inside my land. And that's that's a bit that's a bit weird. Some, uh, in fact, when Hungary is offering to NATO as well. So NATO forces are Hungarian forces as well. Um, then you have the process of what Poland is going to do. Lately, the European Union and Poland relationship was not really good until now. And what is taking place with the Ukrainians may uh, become, if you want, a more polarized, may create a more polarized uh, Polish population than in the near future, not very short. So we need to look at the alliances and the interests that are looking in the region that we're confirming with. However, there is also good opportunity. But this needs, if you want, um, um, what is known as political will. We can implement a fast track entrance to both NATO and the EU. And it can be a track two, if you want, system where you look at the cultural aspects, religious aspects, political aspects, excluding economic, because definitely Ukraine, for example, does not meet the assets at this point. But then again, countries like the Western Balkans, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, uh, even Armenia in this case, can actually discuss the possibility of a fast track entrance in a group of countries. And in a group of countries, this can implement, if you want, possibilities, even for Cyprus, if you want to look at security future. It is of no wonder that Israel yesterday actually went very clear and condemned the Russian atrocities being taking place in Ukraine. Israel is doing a one eye to the European Union, is coming and saying we need a Euro-Med dialogue, an organization to be settled in the Eastern Med, while looking at the NATO and European tracts. NATO also need to be reformed and reshaped. NRF doesn't really matter so much as long as you know the deployment of forces and all these forces, they do not really get engaged. The Russians will never stop and they're looking at the Eastern market economies to be reshaped. We've been seeing what have been happening with Luke Oil and, um, and other related companies, agreements with China in order to finance their long-term wars. We've been seeing how they're going to utilize former Soviet states that are still, if you want, of the near grasp. We forgot exactly what happened in Kazakhstan. So there was a point down, we, we forgot it. And we need to speak also about Central Asia and how Russia will look at Central Asia. Finally, to give you a pivotal role of how Russia sees and projects the world. And I think I will come into an end with this. 
is that Russia has been investing more than $22 billion into Africa and Central Africa for the last years. It is of no wonder that allies and partners like Iran and Turkey have been playing around the, the if you want, the European sequences and been investing also in Africa because they've been seeing what has been handling. The European Union and the United States have been giving more than $124 billion in Africa trying to counterpart China. But what they forgot on the back is that the, the real beast, Russia, is there and when it goes, it goes to stay whereas China goes to make money out of it. And I think I will, I will end by the following, by saying that the European Union and NATO need to decide fast. We really need leaders that take decisions. We cannot afford a global crisis that is actually building up with all this massive population moving. We have an almost genocide like going and we're going to see more and more uses of these words taking place and actually if putin is not stopped in ukraine other countries will follow thank you very much thank you professor eftemiopoulos for your uh, well articulated insights and analysis uh we will take some questions we have many questions actually but um I will start with uh, some of the uh, initial questions. Uh, so uh, Mr. Konstantinos Poyagis asks, uh, how do you comment on uh, westernization, which is the result of the successful hybrid war of the USA in Ukraine and the Russification of Belarus uh, with the rivalry between the West and Russia and the abolition of the buffer zone because of uh, NATO's open door policy in the light of aggressive or defensive realism. So this is, this is a question that is addressed to uh, all of our speakers. Cecilia, may, may, may I propose to go through the questions and we can uh, try to somehow okay. respond. Okay, great. So uh, another question comes from uh, Mr. Dimitrios Makousis. Uh, do you think that we are currently witnessing the start of a war of an emerging financial system between China and Russia against the existing Western system? Um, another question is um, another problem with the attempt to portray Russia's use of force against, U against Ukraine as uh, somehow unique is that NATO as an entity and NATO powers acting outside the framework of the alliance had previously committed multiple acts of flagrant aggression. For example, NATO member Turkey invaded the Republic of Cyprus in 1974 and seized more than a third of the island. So Ankara then proceeded to establish a puppet state, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus in the occupied uh, territory. So this is more or less a comment. Uh, another question to uh, Professor uh, Pandelis Klaas is, um, don't you feel we need to address a new strategic approach to current issues and potential threats? Uh, we are hit by the so-called taboo scenarios in our assessments and forecasting taboo scenarios pose some of the most pernicious risks to organizations and leaders in our age of rising uncertainty and complexity. Problems can fester until they trigger a tipping point disaster. I think that uh, we could uh, um, answer these uh, three questions and then proceed to the other two questions for the panelists. If you want, I can... Uh... I can give a okay. comment on the question in relation to uh, the start of a war of an emerging financial system, China, Russia, against the existing Western system. Well, actually, uh, okay, we are living in a economically and financially interconnected world. For example, we very well know that uh, uh, currently the United States is holding, uh, excuse me, China is holding uh, the vast majority of the American debt. Uh, in the meantime, um, Marios of uh, Tibiopoulos mentioned very well the Chinese economic expansion to, to Africa. 
And uh, we also very well know that currently there is an agreement between Russia and China uh, on, uh, on uh, I suppose, on the ways to uh, secure uh, probably uh, natural gas and the uh, cash, uh, of course, uh, uh, during the period of uh, the Western sanctions. Uh, so, uh, well, I see, I, I, I can see that, uh, again, uh, we have uh, forces that existing before, that were existing before, and uh, they are now getting intensified. Uh, and uh, this uh, financial instability, in my opinion, uh, will continue. Uh, nevertheless, uh, still the balances have to be seen. Uh, speaking about uh, an emerging financial system, China, Russia, against the existing Western system, no, I don't think it's going to be the case. I think that the balances that were there before will still continue uh, to go on. In terms of, uh, but of course, of course, the uh, the, the Russian aggression uh, towards Ukraine is something that intensifies and st further strengthens the, the position of China in the, uh, in the financial system. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, of the issue that was raised on uh, uh, the taboo scenarios, <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, what I, what I, what I uh, usually say is uh, that we always have to uh, also uh, go back to the roots. So we also have some in principle questions to respond. Uh, we decided, uh, and probably uh, because uh, Russia also provided the incentives for us to do so, not to include Russia in the European uh, defense architecture. Uh, and we decided not to, uh, to, to, not, to, 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 not to do so for a variety of reasons, which is not now the proper time to, to develop. So it's not a matter of uh, taboo scenarios or not. It's a matter of issues that were there, in my opinion, that were hidden under the carpet and unfortunately were not faced. Because of the dynamics, uh, these issues now have to be faced. But on the other hand, a variety of geopolitical uh, questions also have to be very carefully addressed. And I mentioned one or two of those, like, for example, the case of uh, the Turkish, the illegal Turkish occupation in uh, the island of Cyprus. It's, it's very interesting uh, to, to say, if I, can, if I can take on this, how we, we see geopolitically each one of us considering the location that we are at uh, i wanted to mention this while you know gela is in georgia in between georgia and ukraine uh, Badelis is in in cyprus uh, professor Antopoulos is is in boston so we all see it in a very different uh, larger perspective considering also the location that we are at and one of the things that are very different and very difficult is to make a judgment that is actually in uh, if you want, uh, that makes an impact on all of us. And that impact, I think Russia and Vladimir Putin knows that the Europeans will never be able to sit down at this stage, at this table, or they might be late in, in taking action, in understanding the complexities of, of, of getting a decision and getting things into perspective. What Putin knows, and he said it, I'm not closing the pipes, gas and oil, it will still go on. So basically I'm negotiating. And at the time when it concerns more the Europeans, he will close it. And that will be the moment when he will negotiate if you want this with Ukraine. Until that moment, the Europeans will try to have meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings. There's another meeting on the 24th of March where President Biden is going to attend the European Union meeting and he's going to address, basically tell the Europeans, take a decision, take a decision right now. But it's so important to make sure that the leaders of today and tomorrow actually provide the necessary skill sets, personal and collective, to represent the national and European interests at the best perspective, because we also have outsiders waiting to become members. So we have to be inspirational to them. Georgia is waiting. Moldova is waiting. Armenia is waiting. Cyprus for NATO may be waiting. 
as long as there is a solution. It's an opportunity. Israel is waiting. Maybe the Arab states talking about a Gulf NATO for many, many years and now liquid, liquefying the opportunities or the lessons to be learned, we're going to be discussing. And what if another organization pops up in the Eastern Med? Or if you want the rounding Black Sea countries again, try to, to unite if you want together against a joint threat, which may be Russia and tomorrow may be financially viability with Europe, uh, where now it doesn't make sense, but tomorrow it will if they actually secure the investments coming from non-European countries, like the Gulf has been doing for many years in, in different countries, including if you want Georgia. So what happens then? Are they gonna wait for them until the European Union members agree to join them or not? Because they have to go global. And you know, one country that did this and has a very good balance, and uh, unfortunately it's very balanced with regards to what's taking Ukraine, and this is Serbia. Serbia has been having a very balanced relationship with the world, not only with the European Union. So we, we are looking at new perspectives, new actions, new methods, new many, many things that will be taken into account. Globalization of the economy, massive investment processes, uh, new uh, economic downturns or trade agreements that will be far more heavy than the ones that were achieved, if you want, uh, by President Trump on behalf of the United States, which I still don't know if it's going to be work profit for the United States or not. Biden is very democratic in his rule as a president of the United States, and he wants to rule as an example. Will he be able to achieve it? These are other issues that need to be answered as well. Thank you. Um, I don't know if the other uh, panelists would like to comment on. Uh... Yeah, the minister. If the minister wants to go first, then I, then I have a few comments. Then. Well, a couple of comments then um, um, on uh, what Marius was saying. Um, yes, but 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 the yes but 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 principle regarding the EU in the sense that uh, uh, Putin's war has accelerated many things in the European Union. Um, and and um, and look at the um, uh, the paradigm shift in Germany's foreign policy, for example. That would have been unthinkable before. Um, look at how the uh, great European powers have uh, assembled together to decrease their energy dependence upon Russia and talk about new ways of uh, um, securing their, their energy. Uh, look at um, uh, how all this populated. Mr. Mr. Orban was smoozing with Mr. Putin weeks before the aggression. Now he turned back into the fold very quickly. Uh, look at Poland. Poland was condemned by the European Court and now is a stellar example of uh, uh, accepting refugees and providing shelters and so on and so forth. I think what this war did to the European Union was that the liberal order that we, we had taken for granted in, in terms of uh, how it had provided for our democratic regimes, how it had provided for our security and safety. Uh, we had taken for granted these 70 years of peace, security, prosperity, and democracy. And I think uh, what this war in, uh, in, the, uh, in the heart of Europe um, has done is to, to, uh, to, ask, to, 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 to tackle Euroscepticism, um, to... to um, uh, undermine the position of the um, of the populists. Mr. Babbitts was out of office, has been was voted out of office, um, and um, Macron seems to um, uh, to be in a position to win the next election. So I, I think that this war has unified Europe to to a large extent, and I think that. Um, um, it was, if it wasn't for the, uh, for the tragedy that we are experiencing in Ukraine, uh, that was a great achievement and uh, we, should, we should thank Mr. Putin for that. Uh, now, uh, one more thing about the, uh, the issue of uh, uh, a NATO member that, uh, um, actually waging war and uh, invading and uh, um, uh, invading Cyprus. Well, this is this is what um, this is what I meant before, and you know uh, we were very critical on uh, the United States uh, regarding the war in Vietnam. We were very critical of the United States uh, when it came to the second Iraq war. 
Um, and we have we have to be very um, we have to to, uh, to 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 be very consistent in our arguments. And I think that um, uh, the violation of national sovereignty is a Westphalian rule that we need to abide by. The um, the um, um, uh, the issue of um, um, uh, violating territorial integrity, invading uh, a sovereign state, I think that it is a disproportionate means of settling um, international disputes. And I think besides every violation of international law that this war has brought about, it has brought about a violation of, of the minimum, the minimum principles of international relations that have to do with proportionality, that have to do with reciprocity, that have to do even with rationality. Uh, now, by that, I don't mean that uh, Putin is irrational to go back to a comment because this is, I think, a serious issue and that we need to address. And um, I will agree with uh, uh, Minister Bezoas really that um, uh, even the, um, the, the escalation on the part of Russia when it came to uh, the nuclear arsenal, putting its nuclear arsenal on, on, uh, on alert, it is a means of uh, uh, securing two factors, two things. Uh, number one, that uh, NATO will not be involved and in the United States will not be involved militarily, militarily in Ukraine. And the second, of course, is to, um, to bully Ukraine to capitulation. Uh, but I do think that um, uh, uh, in, in, in contrast to some analysts here that um, uh, are questioning Putin's uh, rationality, I think he's a rational player. Um, I, I don't think that uh, he, would, he would dare make an escalation that will, uh, that will bring about uh, the annihilation of, uh, of, uh, of our civilization. And, uh, and, and, and to add another point to that, I don't think that he will go a step further than Ukraine. Uh, if, uh, if for anything, if, if anything else, the performance of his military, I think, has shown that the emperor is naked. And I don't think that uh, with the deterrence and the, and the red lines that have been drawn in, in the sand, I don't think that he would dare go a step further than Ukraine. Finally, a point regarding Russia and, and China. We need to be we need to be careful when we. Um, uh, when we, we throw China in Russia's arms. Um, this is um, a tactical kind of convergence, but strategically their interests diverge historically. Uh, China is a Westphalian power. China um, plays and puts a lot of emphasis on the issue of national uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. And this is why it has been very cautious in the way it has addressed this problem. Of course, China uh, uh, loves what is going on because uh, it's a war of attrition of, of its two main adversaries. But I think in the end, it will be very cautious in addressing this, um, this, this dispute to the very end. And finally, when it comes to a, a, a separate international uh, kind of financial system, Let's not forget that um, China has, has tried, is trying to build a sinocentric kind of international financial order. All the BRI with all the, uh, the financial institutions that uh, accompany it is an effort to build a sinocentric kind of, of, uh, of international order. But um, I, I will agree with Pandelis that the interconnectedness of, of, the, uh, of the globalized economy at least is such that uh, I don't think that we can see um, we can see that um, uh, uh, you know being disrupted in the in the long scheme of things. So I do think that um, uh, this uh, war will bring a lot of uh, uh, destruction in in, uh, in in the economies not only of Russia but also of the West. The West will suffer. Uh, we will pay the price and we should pay the price uh, for democracy. This is the new division, dividing line. These are the new dividing lines, democracies versus authoritarian, uh, versus authoritarian states. So we need to pay a price and we will pay the price. Um, uh, inflation is going up. Uh, the uh, energy prices are going up. Uh, uh, you see it in, in the gas pump in the United States, in Europe, everywhere. 
the West will suffer. Uh, but I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a price uh, that we need to pay. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, Mr. Beshwas really would like to make a. Okay, uh, so uh, the last question, and then uh, we will have to end this uh, this session. So uh, the last question is: uh, Will President Biden's expected visit to Europe bring forth a more broad inter interpretation of what NATO assumes as its limits in foreign military aid vis-à-vis -vis Ukraine? This is addressed to all of the, our panelists. I think that Marios and Constantinos maybe would like to. Okay. Uh, I was getting I was getting ready to leave it to you, but you know, I I think I think um, I think from the experiences uh, that other other people have uh, with regards to NATO EU agreements and summit meetings and U.S. to EU, obviously this is an important event and it shows the stage that we have reached out. But I still and firmly believe what was said by the predecessing speakers, that we, we, we definitely need a European architecture that actually does more and better and stronger and more practical, right? We are over the European ideology, whether we belong to Europe or not. We all belong to the European Union and to the European process. That is clear. Okay. And, you know, the Russian case makes it more obvious. I agree. But things are not over yet. Things are not over yet. It put in, put in as a rational and realist as he is. And I foresaid in the beginning, he's not a civilian. He's wearing a suit and tie, but he's not a civilian. He does not think civilian. He does not, he, he didn't care about the electorate. He cared about being elected, but he knew that he's gonna be elected. That's why he wanted Yeltsin support in the first place. Now, what is most important? What is most important is to understand the future complexities that come about. It was mentioned by Gela. It was mentioned by uh, Professor Sklas. It was mentioned by uh, Professor Vanitopoulos, that the, the whole market economy will have to be reshaped and the whole understanding of the cohesion of the European Union will have to be reshaped. The whole process of understanding the transatlantic ties will have to be reshaped. And fortunately or unfortunately, the United States it will not play a pivotal role as it played through Marshall Plan onwards. It will not. The Europeans will have to put their feet on the ground now. And again, we need to be inspirational to the members or future members coming, whether these are Europeans or uh, North Africa and Middle East or resolution of conflicts and so forth. We need a global EU. We need a global EU. And in order to have a global EU, we need more action. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, just, just a brief comment. Uh, I, I think another uh, uh, great achievement of Putin's war is that he resurrected the Biden presidency. Uh, before the <laughs> war, uh, Biden's <laughs> approval rates were abysmal. Uh, now, uh, the American Good public man. opinion, even the Republicans are united behind Biden. Uh, yes. But having said that, let me say that the Biden administration made a couple of mistakes early on. Um, as far as the Europeans are concerned. Uh, the hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan without prior consultations with the uh, Europeans um, was one. AUKUS was another. Um, the agreement that um, uh, took the uh, rank underneath the uh, friend's feet. Uh, but uh, having said those, I think this is an administration that learns from its mistakes. We are very lucky to have an American president that is an old hand in foreign policy and he's experienced in cautious. Uh, if we had a new untested president, when Putin um, escalated, putting on alert his nuclear arsenal, we would have a president here. If we had a president here that was untested, he might have uh, reciprocated. And this would have brought the escalation 
to, to a very uh, critical level of alert. Uh, Biden was cautious. He didn't follow through. Um, and, and he's being cautious uh, as far as the involvement in um, as putting boots on the ground. He is very cautious because he wants to avoid the Third World War. He is denying uh, the issue of a fly zone of, of, uh, uh, that would protect the Ukrainian uh, uh, airspace because he wants to avoid the Third World War. But having said that, he has um, followed the policy of consultation uh, of consultation with his uh, with our European allies that have um, fostered this unity uh, that we see over the last uh, weeks or so. And I think his visit um, is a way of further galvanizing the transatlantic partnership and uh, and and actually recoupling the two uh, sides of the Atlantic after the dramatic uh, Trump presidency. And I think we will see the beginnings of the articulation of this new division of labor very much along the lines that I, uh, I argued before, and I think Marius also uh, argued a minute ago. And, and so I think that we, we are uh, witnessing, you know, um, qualitative changes uh, in the division of labor of the transatlantic space. And this, I think, is um, uh, the subtext of the, uh, of the um, meetings that will um, take place in, in Europe in a few weeks. Gela? No, nothing to add. Very, very interesting discussion. Uh, nothing to add, uh, actually, because everything has been said, we have covered um, actually, the uh, uh, the huge area, um, you know, they eat, you know, there are several topics that you can spend hours and hours, and we spend instead of one and a half hour, it's already two and a half hours. Um, and um, so, uh, I only wish to to continue in this uh, in this way, Marius. Um, uh, we need to we need to probably divide this uh, topic into the pieces and uh, probably discuss in details um, uh, some. In detail some areas that really require uh, more attention and again uh, I think that within the next two weeks and I, 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 I think that next two weeks will, uh, will shape uh, the picture what kind of world we will be dealing with. Uh, really, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sad you know, I'm engaged in this you know day and night this Ukrainian issue is uh, predominant here and, um, and um, uh, the Ukraine is fighting, waging the war. They are fighting. They are fighting not only for their freedom and their land. We here in Georgia, we know on our skin how it is. So they are fighting for us too. They are fighting not only for us, they are fighting for Paul, they are fighting for you. And uh, it is very unfortunate that the huge price, yeah. huge price will be paid by Ukraine. There will be winners, there will be losers, but the price is being paid by Ukrainians. And that's, that's a very sad story. Uh, optimistically speaking, I think if Ukraine will resist with the same kind of bravery and resistance and effectiveness within the next two weeks, then we will have a different talk. And I, I, I invite you to discuss this um, after a while. So thank you for the discussion, uh, for, for an interesting meeting, and I wish you all the best and the peace. Well, uh, to this point in time, uh, I would like to extend a warm uh, thanks to our uh, esteemed and well-known speakers for sharing with us their thoughts and arguments and presenting their informed analysis on um, uh, European defense architecture. So uh, again, uh, the webinar was a collaboration of the Neapolis University Pathos and Strategy International. Uh, and the event is also supported by the NUP Liaison Office in cooperation with the Department of History, Politics and International Studies and take place uh, under the Career Month Framework for 2022. Uh, a last remark, uh, the webinar will be archived on NUP and Strategy International website and uh, channels on YouTube. So uh, thank you and have a good night and uh, a wonderful week, everyone.
Have a good night. Thank you. Bye, Thank gentlemen. You Thank you. Nice to having you. Thank you. Thank you.